We last, um, we last spoke probably five years ago when you were talking about uh, your wonderful book, The Inevitable, and now you've got a new book out, Excellent Advice for Living, Wisdom I Wish I'd Known Earlier. Um, so just curious about what led up to, to writing this book. It's very different from anything you've done before, I think, isn't it? It is. That is true. It's also much shorter than anything I've written before. Um, so um, I, I, I began kind of writing notes to myself about these little aphorisms, little proverbs, because I found that they were useful to me to help me recall advice that I'd either heard from somewhere else or kind of concluded on my own and the having these in a little kind of a little capsule I found really really easy to to try to change my behavior and uh, you know an example of one of the bits of advice from the book was like if I was to lose track of something in my house I know I have it but I don't know where it is and so when I find it and I finally find it it was repeating to myself don't put it back where I found it put it back where I first looked for it so that was kind of like a useful thing. I would repeat, repeat myself. Okay, I'm going to put it back, put it back where I first looked for it. Or if there's um, someone, there's a contentious, contentious issue with two sides to it, I would always say to myself, what's the third side? That kind of breaks the logjam of this dilemma, of this controversy. What's the third side? And so these kinds of things I would just kind of accumulate. And then um, some of them, I didn't really, it took me until... 10 years ago to I was sixties to realize these things. And I thought, I really wished I'd known these earlier. And I thought about writing them down to try and gift them to my children. Um, we were not a family that I didn't do much preaching or even advising our kids. We our, our my philosophy was that they learn by watching us, but they don't, they don't listen to what we say. They watch what we do. So we were kind of a, leading by example rather than by preaching but i felt that there was that this little bits were important and would be useful rather than a sermon and so um i wrote them down initially to give them to my kids and they shared it to my family people were very enthusiastic they kind of went viral and i decided that it would be really cool to put them into a little tiny book mm -hmm. that you could hand to a young person or someone young at heart Super, and I think in the in the intro you you refer to it as channeling chan, channeling the wisdom of the ages, and and as I read through it, I mean I recognised you know some of the um, well not the writings but some of the sentiments of people like Warren Buffett. I mean talking about compounding, long term thinking, the inner scorecard, incentives, um, and then you know people like um, Jim Rowan talking about habits, and even David. David Allen talking about time management, but I, I guess you know, as you said, you, 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 they come from multiple sources. Is there any particular source that is overrepresented or particularly re represented here, beyond, beyond your own wisdom, I guess? <laughs> well, I, I, I am sure that my own Christianity leaks out here, um, you know, from the Golden Rule and beyond. Um, I am, I, I call myself a Christian and I, and I think that that perspective is even more than Buddhism. It kind of infuses this of um, perpetual kindness and compassion, um, which is, you know, at the, at the heart of it, of the of legitimate version of Christianity. And I think um, uh, the idea of, um, treating people as you want to be treated yourself that those golden rules it's it's like that is the root of all these other ones of being patient of trying to um uh put yourself in other people's views i mean so so i would say that by and large for better or worse um i am I mean, th this this is infused with with a Christian perspective, or there shouldn't be much that contradicts mm -hmm. that uh, uh, that I'm aware of. Okay, I mean, um, just thinking about how to how to start this conversation or how to get into the content, and 
I was just reflecting. I mean, you, you, you. I think it's about fifty years ago. You started traveling, and you, um, you culminated in this wonderful book, which I, I mean, I say it's wonderful. I, I, when I go to America this summer, I'm, I'm having it. Sh- I'm going to pick it up when I get there because it's too oh, heavy. That, that's too not, heavy a good, to be not a good idea. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> this is like, oh my gosh, I'm, I'm touched. But I'm just letting you know that it is a monster. So I what you're get talking about? To Switzerland, then should I? Yes, you should. You absolutely okay, should. I'll do that. Um, but, but it's very, it's very expensive too to ship because okay. um, I, I, I've had to do that. But you're referring to my Vanishing Asia book, which is this thirty-pound yep. monster, three volumes, nine thousand images, a thousand pages, of my fifty years traveling in remote parts of Asia, documenting the ceremonies festivals the the lifestyle the designs that are disappearing and um it was a work of um insanity passion compulsion art uh you know it's just like yeah, yeah. uh and and it actually um touches on another one of the um bits of advice i have in my book that i think is pretty core which is don't aim to be the best Aim to be the only. And and I was going to come. I was can can we hold that thought because I was going. I mean, there were you know I'm a traveler as well, and uh, I mean there were a number of very interesting travel quotes. So maybe just yeah. if I just just play a couple back to you, and then um, then maybe you can comment on on your overall philosophy. You know, a vacation and a disaster equals an adventure. <laughs> uh, the major major part of travel is to learn to leave stuff behind the more you leave behind the further you will advance um the, your enjoyment of travel is inversely proportional to the um to i think yeah the size of your luggage and then you travel to passions rather than destinations and the final one is go to the most remote place first and then go back i, I mean there was a lot in there and given that's where you started your career i just wanted you know how would you kind of you know, maybe you just comment on, on, on your view of travel and, and why it found a place in, these, uh, in, in, your, in, your, uh, in your book. Yeah, 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 fair enough. There, there are, I, I think, to, to my perspective, there are kind of three categories or three main reasons to travel. One is um, restitution, you know, refresh, refreshing, rejuvenation. And that's the kind of inclination to go to spas and resorts where you kind of can relax. And, and I'm a huge proponent of goofing off and um, Sabbaths and um, sabbaticals and vacations and, and stopping. I think it's really essential. And that's another bit of advice is that, you know, to optimize your productivity, you have to have a, a good a rest ethic. And so, mm-hmm. So that's one thing of travel can do is it, it can um, be a, a relief and a, and, and, a, and, a, and a resort and a pampering. That's not my preferred style, but it's going to be part of it. The other one is adventure. You're going to test yourself to um, climb the highest mountain to, you know, ski down the steepest slope or um, in some ways go into the jungle or safari, those, those kinds of things. And then there's a third one, which is about um, encountering the other and learning. And that's where I tend to, to go. So, so I tend to arrange things to maximize and optimize differences, learning, encountering the new, changing my mind, um, being innovative, um, and confronting all that kind of stuff. And um, so my advice is, is a little bit more skewed to to the kind of travel that um, in, you know, gender that kind of um, growth. And um, I think that that aspect of travel is so powerful, particularly for young people, that we should, as a nation and other nations, subsidize it. It's, it's so transformative when you're young that... Um, it's almost to me essential to, to grow and particularly in this kind of coming planetary culture, planetary thing that we're making, just, just to, just to give you some idea of the scale and diversity um, that's available and to change, change your mind. And I think it's much harder to start wars if you've been to a place um, and visited and hung out with the people. And so um 
Uh, so anyway, so I think travel is essential for growth, um, if at all possible. And there are plenty of people on the planet who are struggling just to survive and don't have that privilege. So I would say, if you have that privilege, if at all, mm-hmm. manage it, take advantage of that. Yeah, because I mean, in, in Europe, and I think also in Australia and New Zealand, there is almost like a rite of passage, which is the gap year. And I, I don't know whether it, it's not such a thing in America, I don't think, is it? There absolutely isn't. And by the way, if there had been when I was growing up, I probably would have stayed in college, but I had to make my, there was no thing as a gap year. There was no thing as internship. There was nothing. It was just grade 13, 14. I was like, I couldn't take that. So, um, uh, yes. And, 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 um, we have Peace Corps and stuff and, and, mm-hmm. and that's a great option that, that people should take more advantage. Of. I believe that we should have mandatory national service for everybody. And I literally mean everybody, whether you're handicapped mm-hmm. or not, you can still contribute. And so, a mandatory national service that would include options of going abroad, like Peace Corps and other things like that, and or military if you want it. And so um, uh, I know the Mormons have basically a mandatory two-year mm-hmm. missionary thing for all the males. And man, that has transformed them. They're, they're incredibly prosperous because I believe in part because of those those two years that they spent in another country trying to sell something but still they were they were encountering a different way of looking at the world yeah yeah and uh, before we get back to the book i mean i'm curious where where would you i mean you 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 spent a number of years in asia um where would you which if you were starting out again doing not doing a similar trip but i mean on on that sort of void where would you be going if, if you if if the lens was to sort of um to you know, to, to document a vanishing world. Which part of the world would you set out to, to visit um, in 2023? Okay, I, I, I you know, I, I would have been documenting these disappearing things until just the book was published. So there are pockets of the world where there are these extent un, undeveloped um, areas of the world and I and I spent an awful lot of time seeking them out and trying to get to them, and so um, th- um, if you were to go out today and wanted to see these things that remained, um, I would go to places like Oman. Mm-hmm. Oman is the Arabia that hasn't been completely um, paved over. Um, Saudi Arabia itself, there's. It's very, very, very because of the money. It's just very, very um, developed and, and and altered, and there's not much traditional culture. But Oman does it has incredible Arabian culture, still very, very um, intact. Um, Myanmar, we call, used to call Burma, um, is one of the least developed uh, countries that has a very rich traditions. They're still going. And um, particularly in the countryside, um, Bali, in a weird way, despite the fact that it's a tourist attraction, they're doing things for themselves, all those ceremonies and stuff. And it's 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 one places in the world where tourism has actually de- helped them deepen and finance their own obsession with their rituals and ceremonies. Um, Let's see, uh, Mongolia, um, among all the countries in the world, they decided to endorse their nomads rather than try to um, remove them from their nomadism. And um, that's really interesting. So there, there's a million mm-hmm. nomads in Mongolia that um, are modern modernized and they live in the yurts and basically they're mobile ranchers they they're, they're ranches mm-hmm. with two 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 ranches one summer ranch and one winter ranch and they move in between them that's basically what it is but it's unfenced uh you know nomadic life that's very much um very different from from most city life so i could go on but those are a couple starts mm-hmm. yeah yeah that's great I, 
and, and then, I mean, so, so that's travel. Then I interrupted you, but you talked about one of the things that you, um, that, that came out of your, um, uh, out of your travel was the idea of don't be the best, be the only. Can yes. you say a little bit more about that? So, um, that was, that, that was my, my, my travel, my book, Vanishing Asia. It was like, that's a book that nobody else is ever would ever make, could make, would want to make, has ever made, by the way. I mean, I, I have I have 20 feet, more than 20 feet of photo books of Asia. I have every single one of them. And uh, many, I have a library here of thousands and thousands of volumes, two stories. Um, and there's not another book like this in the world, mm-hmm. past or present. And so, um, so this was sort of, an only thing, and 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 what um, what I learned at my time at Wired, um, my role at Wired was often commissioning stories. So we'd have story ideas. We get this great idea. We try to find the right writer for it to write the story, and um, oftentimes they'd have this really great idea, and I'd try to sell it to the authors, the writers. They didn't like it. Didn't want to do it. Didn't think it was very good. All right, that's the way it goes. Most of the ideas are not really good. But then that idea would come back maybe a year later. It's like, you know, that that really was a great idea. I try to sell it again, try to get, give it away. And again, no uptake. And, and then, so I say, okay, it's dead. But then it would come back. It was like, wait a minute, that, what, that, that was a good idea. There's something there. It's not going away. Try to sell it again, no takers. And then I would realize, oh, no, no, no. Okay, I have to write this. This is this is a story that I'm the only one who thinks it is really good. I need to write it, and that would turn out to be some of the best things that I would write. And so this idea of kind of trying to give away things, um, and end up doing the things that only I could do, and um, so I got into the habit of kind of being really generous with ideas and always talking about what I'm working on, with the hope that somebody else would steal it or do it. Because if they were to do it, that means whoosh, I don't need to do that one because that person's done it. I'm only going to do the things that no one else would do or could do. Now, that took me many, many years to realize, and it is something you can that takes most of your life to kind of get to, to realize what it is that only you can do. So it's a very high bar. But I think that's where you want to aim to. You want to aim towards coming to the point where you are the only one doing it. And I have another piece of advice about, you know, if you're young – try to work on something where there's no name for what it is that you do because mm-hmm. you're more mm-hmm. likely to kind of be in the territory of the only rather than just the best. And so, um, so yeah. So, you know, if you're young and like me for many, many years, I thought the Holy Trinity of an occupation or a career was to be working on something that I love to do, something that I was good at doing and something that would pay well. It's like, okay, what could be better? Well, actually there is something, there is another level. And if you get to that one, the next level is to do things that only you can do. So now I have four things when I have to filter to think about what I'm going to do is, yeah, um, there are things that I would love to do. It'd be fun to do. I'd be good at it and I get paid well, but someone else could do that. I'm not going to do it. I'm going to do the ones that only I can do. And so, um, so that is, again, I think there's maybe a few people who are born young and kind of know that with, about themselves. But for most mm-hmm. of us, this is a long winding journey full of detours and serendipitous encounters and luck to get a sense of what it is that we're the only about. Yeah, I mean, that struck me. I mean, there's lots of advice which, you know, is, I'm going to say evident, but I mean, which is quite easy to communicate. But that, and, and it's easy for a a, a, a kid, um, I think my children are a little bit younger than yours, but it's easy for them to get their minds around. But this is one where it's, you know, it is clearly something that you said you developed that insight later on in life. And it's, it's quite difficult to, you know, to figure out how to, 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 to explain that because people that need to have done quite a lot of living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. At that point, I guess. Right. But, but the point of this book, Excellent Advice for Living, is to encapsulate things so, so you can repeat it to yourself. And now once you've heard it, yeah. You know, don't aim to be the best, aim to be the only. You can keep that in your mind. You can remind yourself, like when you when when you're being asked, 
to do something or have an opportunity to just like, okay, don't be the best, be the only. And so um, there is a lot packed into that. In fact, that's what I tried to do with the book is take entire books of, of advice and reduce it to a single sentence. And that was my, my challenge and my joy was, can I take that and put it into just a sentence that could be tweeted to a friend? And um, I sometimes succeeded. And that's sort of what the book is about. Yeah, no, I, I get that. And I, I, I mean, I, I think um, one of the, you know, part that I'm interested in, and when, when did these insights, you know, when did you uncover them and when did you come across them? And I mean, maybe the, the, the next area um, is this idea of finite versus infinite games. Because yeah. it's a very, very powerful concept. One that's probably quite, quite hard for people to um, embody earlier on in their careers. I mean, you know, I was just trying to work out, work out. I mean, the, the book, the original book was published in 85. Did, were you, were you prompted um, to, I mean, did this insight come as a result of reading that book or was it more a case of you figuring it out and then just using this language? I'm just interested in how, how this came about, this particular idea. Yeah, so the, the book that you're referring to is by James Cars, and it was called Finite and Infinite Games. And he was a pastor, actually. Mm -hmm. And um, it's a very long, complicated book that I actually found very hard to read. Um, and he gets off onto more, um, I wouldn't say theological, but sort of more pastoral um, concerns. Um, the book is worth, the first chapter and the last chapter is really kind of the ones that are worth reading. Um, and um, no, I, I, I did not come to this myself. This was, um, this was his insight, but reading that book really did illuminate i mean it was like i kind of i kind of kind of intuitively leaning that direction but it articulated it in a way mm -hmm. that i found very handy and this was sort of like again what i think this book can do it it, it put some language onto this idea and it made it very handy so i could i could reach for it there's a handle now and i could i could grab it when i needed it and mm -hmm. the just to to kind of follow through the the premise of the book finite infinite games of what there was is that the there were two kinds of games in the world there was finite ones where there's winners and losers and there were rules and you had it was completely unfair to to break the rules so you had to adhere to the rules and then you'd have winners and losers and that's what most sports are about they're fine they're good but there's another kind of game called the infinite game where there aren't winners and losers and the the whole point of the game is to kind of keep the game going and maybe to bring as many people into the game as possible. And there's, that's an analogy, of course. And, and his, his point was that most of life, the important things of life, are more like infinite games than finite games. And that um, what you want to try and keep doing is um, have an infinite game. And one of the things about infinite games that's different from finite games is that the rules are always changing. That one of the ways you keep the game going is you keep changing the rule, which is completely verboten in a finite game. Okay. Um, and so this is idea of like this ongoing open-ended game, the infinite game, where, where you're rewarded by how long the game goes, how many people are involved, if you can bring more of the world into it. And the kicker, of course, which I don't get into in my book, of wisdom, but is is in his book is that uh, he says there's only one infinite game. All right, so that's the that's the I'm, as it's a spoiler. Um, the spoiler is that there's only one infinite game. Um, all infinite games are the same game, and so um, that came from James Cars. And my takeaway and my retelling of it is that you know. There are two kinds of games, finite games and infinite games. One are open-ended and you want to always seek infinite games because the upside is infinite. So um, if you feel that there's a game being played that's, that's winner and losers and zero sum, that's fine for sport, but it may not be a game that you really want to dedicate your life to. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and and of course, I mean, I, I was looking at one of your um, uh, YouTube videos, I think for Ch for a China Telecom or something like that, um, where you were talking about um, 
the infinite this this topic and i think you said that google in some respects is playing an infinite game and that kind of got me thinking that you can actually be playing an infinite game within a within a finite game in the sense of you know the capital markets are probably the most finite game that, that, that uh, people are playing if they're participating but i think you were saying that certain aspects of google and and i suppose you know to some extent certain aspects of amazon you know uh, during bezos's reign were and based on more elements of the infinite game than on the finite game. Right. I mean, our economy is an infinite game, not a finite game, because we are actually increasing the amount of money. It's not like there's a fixed amount of money. We still have, you know, the same amount of money that we had a thousand years ago. We have a lot more money. It's growing. So so we're, we're there are winners and losers, but there is this growing economy that is infinite in potential and so there is a larger economic infinite game going on um, even though there are definite you know there's kind of a finite game in terms of stocks those are mm-hmm. the, 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 you can only sell one to another person who buys one if you get one you lose yours and so but but the, the as a whole there is an infinite game going on so so um, I think people like Jeff Bezos can recognize that the um, there's more to be gained by expanding the economy and by expanding things rather than just trying to um, steal someone's um, winnings. And so, um, so yes, so I, I think, uh, and that's, and I think even investments, that's, that's the thing is, is that you want to understand that there is a way to grow the pie rather than just um, swapping pieces of the pie and um, yeah. head my advice is for your own, both for your own development, for your own growth, and for your own wealth, head towards the infinite ones that, that expand everything. Yeah, yeah. And, and when when did this? Um, when did you reach this conclusion? Because I mean, it, it, it's it's an interest. You know, it, it's it's again. This is another one where it's hard if I if I'm talking to my kids who are about to enter the workforce. I mean, it's a it's a hard one to reconcile with the realities of, you know, getting a degree and going out and finding a job. And I just I just again I'm curious on your journey and how how that translates into the advice that you might give to your kids or to the young. Well, well, um, again, it's a, I think I intuited this very early, and and you know, there's a there's an element of well, I mean, the infinite game rewards generosity, okay, and mm-hmm. and I, I have always knew I've always known that. I mean, I've always known that there's this very, very weird paradox at the foundation of our human societal collective existence. And that foundational paradox is that if you were totally selfish, the most selfish thing you could do was to be generous. Okay, that the more you give, the more you get. Okay, that yeah, that yeah. makes no sense whatsoever, but that is for me a foundational element of the universe. That the more you give, the more you get. That if you're kind to others, they'll be even kinder back. If um, that, that 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 you cannot deplete your generosity and kindness. Okay, and so I don't know why that works. It doesn't make any sense. But it is, and so I, I've always known that. And can you, the, do you know, do you remember when when did you first reach that conclusion? Because it is a, I mean, I know you're not talking as a as a sort of a, a West Coast woo woo kind of, you know, I mean, because because there's quite a lot of the world that, that, that looks at that kind of idea in that way. And I'm just curious about how. I know you're a very different, rational kind of person. I mean, that, when was the point at which that kind of, I mean, well, what happened that we get led you to that conclusion? Do you remember or when it was? I think it was when I was traveling. I think it was when I was first traveling. I, I left, and I went to Taiwan in 1972. And, you know, when, when you're, I didn't have very much money and I was at the, um, you know, I, I had to rely on strangers. I literally had to rely on strangers and their, and their kindness. And, um, I just and, and and there were other travelers who were maybe not as generous or kind or trusting or whatever it is. And seeing what happened to them, they were kind of like 
if a person was really distrustful, they were a magnet for bad things to happen to. And so it was like, whoa, that's interesting. The, the people who are having the most fun, who have the best time, who get all these things, they're the kindest and the, the most generous. It's like, all right, I, I want to do that. So um, I think maybe it was, yeah, I think it was brought into relief when I was traveling, just seeing how things worked that way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that was one of the counterintuitive ideas that I'd flagged, that, that quote you just gave, the more you give to others, the more you'll get. I mean, another one which struck me was, um, rather than steering your life to avoid the unexpected, <laughs> aim directly for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, what's the word I want? Yeah, I'm trying to maximize learning. I'm trying to encourage other people to be lifelong learners to grow. To personal growth. And personal growth to me is a lot about you have to be willing to have some discomfort. You have to be willing to say, I don't know. You have to um, you have beginner's mind. You've, you've, you've got to have uncomfortable conversations with people. There's, there's, there, and a lot of that is all about, um, it's about learning and um, uh, uh, being, what's the word I want? Um, being humble. And so, um, uh that, you know, that stance, I think, is um, something that uh, I'm going to just keep promoting. And, and the book tackles it in many different ways, uh, but it's kind of repeating the same thing over and over again. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But I mean, you know, I mean, can you give an example of going towards the unexpected? I mean, what, what, what does that, what's that look like? For you recently, for instance, any project that you've taken, which people have said, "What are you doing?" But that's a, but but which uh, has taken you towards the unexpected. Um, yeah, it's just really good. Um, so, right. So, uh, so for a year, I did uh, a piece of art a day, which I did myself on an iPad. Or, or other physical things. And then um, I decided this year to do a piece of art with AI. And um, that was unexpected. And some people feel like I'm cheating. <laughs> and and uh, 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 you know, it's like, well, does that count? And, and I'm, and that was unexpected. And the, yeah, it definitely counts to me because it's, you know, you have to become an AI whisperer. You've got to, you've got to converse with this. Uh, the images I produce take, take almost as long as my other ones to produce, you know, 20 minutes to half an hour. And so um, it counts in my eyes. So maybe that's, that was sort of an headed towards the unexpected in the sense of calling it art or treating it as art rather than anything else. It's like, no, I am doing art. I'm calling it art. And that's, you know, that that was sort of unexpected for me. I would not have thought about yeah. that. Okay. Um, we touched on rites of passage earlier on, um, you know, in the, in the context of, um, you know, the gap year. I mean, but you also talk about creating rites of passage in, in your family life. Can you, I mean, can you give some kind of, you know, well, firstly, why do you, I mean, given these studied cultures and many of these cultures, I guess, have quite clear rites of passage, you know, as people transition from childhood into adulthood, we seem to have lost it. Um, why do you think that is? And, 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 and what have you done to sort of bring that back to at least your sort of domestic unit? Yeah, I don't really know why we lost it. Um, I mean, we have other holidays and things. I'm not sure why we've lost it, but I, I do think it is a loss. And as you as you correctly note, many cultures have a very ingrained um, right as passage into adulthood, but uh, we, at least in America, don't. And um, we decided to rectify that by, by, by making our own ceremony. We have three kids. And as they went through this, which we um, designated at 21, we said, okay, this, okay. this is a legal age. And so we had some things that we did for all three and we also had the three of them help devise tailor customize their own version of this rite of passage so um 
for um, so so the the thing that we would do is there would be we'd have a little ceremony and they could choose who was going to be at it. Sometimes it was family, sometimes it was our friends, very small, and there'd be my wife and I, and we would have a red ribbon tied around our waist, and the red ribbon would go to our child, and they would take the scissors and they would cut the red ribbon connecting us, the umbilical cord. We would hand them their last check. We would say, this is the last check from us, which was the last check. Mm -hmm. Um, We'd have the first legal drink. We would toast the first legal drink. (laughs) And um, then they would have uh, various things, like our oldest um, daughter decided she wanted to get baptized in the hot tub in the backyard. (laughs) And we have a little baptism ceremony. My son decided that he wanted um, everybody, this is interesting, to to write bits of advice down on some edible paper with edible ink. And then he would read them out and consume them. And then he said he also wanted to um, go to the beach and he wanted to run in and dive in as a boy and walk out as a man. Which he did. And that was like, wow, that's really incredible. Um, Our other daughter um, decided she wanted to bake bread and kind of give it out to everybody, feed everybody a little bit of bread that she made, almost like a communion. And she had another, um, I can't remember what the other thing that she did. Um, She had a couple other little very um, new age kind of ceremonies that that she did to mark this passage. I think she was read some things um so these were very memorable and and they were um what's the word i want um they were definite they were saying yes okay we're 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 transitioning you're on your own um you're an adult now you have to be responsible and um you know uh to the point in the book it was very easy to do And I wish that we had done more of them. If I had any regret, I wish we had more things like that in our family life because as the kids got older, they relied and went back to the few little things we did on a regular basis. Um, And I realized that these were kind of really cheap and expensive easy things that became very meaningful over time and yeah. and and the joke the joke is is that it becomes a ritual if you repeat it for three times if you do something for three times it's now a ritual and if you keep doing it it becomes meaningful in a weird way so pancakes every sunday morning without fail for years and years and years and years and years and that was a ritual that was sort of it's just pancakes but because you did it on a regular schedule, there was this anticipation, this expectation, this identity creating bond that was invaluable. Yeah, lovely, lovely. Um, I'm mindful of time. So, I mean, if we can um, maybe just touch a little bit on, on some other topics around, I mean, when we, I, I reread our, um, our conversation about the inevitable and, um, yeah, I have to say, I mean, I knew you were a futurist and, and, and my experience having reread it was confirmed by, I mean, some of the things you were saying, particularly around AI, were very prescient. So there were a couple of points you were making. I mean, the first one was about, you know, AI not about replacing, it's about replacing tasks versus, um, versus jobs. And you talked about, uh, you know, AI as being your partner versus uh, something that you replace. I'm just wondering, I mean, how... Obviously, a lot, a lot has happened in, in the world of AI, particularly in the last couple of weeks, and obviously you know, over the years behind the scenes as well. Is this? Too, I mean, how are you? How are you thinking about AI and its impact on on the workplace at the moment, specifically? That's my first question. I just wonder how that, how your thinking yeah, yeah. has changed in that area. I, I've been putting out challenges to people to actually name, give me a, give me a, a, a real person who's actually lost their job to AI, and and there mm-hmm. hasn't been any. I think I might be able to find one person in the um, transcription business, the old business of humans taking audible sound and transcribing it. If if there were people who actually had their job that way, there probably aren't very many because that is definitely something that the, uh, the bots can do now today very well. 
And um, so, but but in general, what we don't, what we're not seeing is this large scale unemployment due to AI. At, at the other end, what we are seeing, and what I'm doing every day now, is um, using these things as interns. That that that's my current frame of reference, my model. ChatGPT is an incredible intern. It's an intern is that you offload all kinds of things to it, but you have to check their work and you okay. don't release okay. their work is your work. You have to kind of work on it. It's like a first draft the intern doing the summary. They're doing the, they're doing all this stuff of, of behind the scenes and working with you for you to present something. So even in the AI image generators, it's very rare when the very first thing you get is the, is what you can use. I mean, it's, you can be surprised by it, but it's very hard to get it to obey where you want to go. And so um, there's this long conversation of AI whispering and incantations and working with them and getting better at it as if they were an intern. Okay, yeah, here, that's good. Go back and do this. How about that? Okay, no, 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 a little bit more of this. And so um, and so this, this idea of partners, I, I think, is being borne out. And... Um, um, what we're seeing is, is that, you know, like say in the image generators, there are some people who are really, really good at it. And you look at it and say, how did you do that? And it's sort of like Picasso's answers. Well, yeah, it only took me 10,000 hours of practicing with this and doing it over again and, and having C's and have my special prompts that I use and, and knowing how it works. And so, um, and so there are going to be people who are going to be better at working with the AIs than others. And we also, they have personalities. There's, you know, making the images. Mid-Journey has been engineered and trained to be more arty. Dolly has been engineered and trained on more photographic type stuff. Stable Diffusion has its own kind of personality and niche and biases. And so we're going to use different tools for different things. And some people are going to be more comfortable with certain kinds of personal AIs and others will find it too alien and don't want to deal with it. And so, um, and so we're going to, so first of all, we're going to have many of them. They're not one AI, the AI is plural. That's coming true. Um, and they, uh, I, I, I'm, I think the idea of having partners that we're going to mix in our own human preferences into these partners and so there there's going to be people who just can't deal with, with the alienness of certain things but are going to be comfortable with other things and so in people trying this we're going to have to kind of understand that you, the first couple of ais you try may not work for you mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and you should not give up but try a different one i mean it was I presume you've been following the, what's happened recently about you know the jailbreaking of Sydney and um, this, this, these extraordinary stories. I mean, what the, se the, the second point, and I'll come back. I mean, the, the reason I raise this is the second comment you made five years ago when we spoke was that you were concerned about um, you were you were you were worried that we were we we were going to abuse AI and treat it like slaves. Right, <laughs> and, right, and right, some right. Of the, some of people's behaviours as, as they were trying to jailbreak this um the microsoft um, right you know, they, they these are black mirrors in some way that they reflect yeah. how you treat them and right. um uh, you know the full the full dialogue of this is is yeah i mean these are imaginary friends right mm -hmm. so, so the fact that you can get an ai to say something doesn't mean the ai believes that it's it's like they're just mm -hmm. They're mirroring you. They're they're mimicking humans, and um, they can exhibit many personalities because they don't really have a unified personality. And so, um, yeah. So these are the early days. Um, here's what I would say about this. This is kind of maybe where we are right now, which is that um, these are these these uh, these versions of AIs are. Autocomplete. They're they're mimicking humans. They look like the, they looked at all the things that humans have drawn, all the humans, everything that we've written, and they're going to say, based on everything that you've written or said or or pictured, I'm going to predict that this is the next thing. You you start me going, and I'm going to complete okay. it, mimicking 
humans. So the so they're mimicking the average human behavior, which is not necessarily the noblest human behavior. All right. So well, on average, humans are probably racist and sexist and everything else and, yeah. and flawed. And so the and so these things are going to be like that. And here's the and here's the important thing. We are going to demand that these bots be better than us. Okay? We're not going to accept them to be like us. We want them to be better than us. And that's actually something we can do. We can actually program in ethics and morality into these bots. But we don't have any idea what it means or how to be better than us. We don't have any consensus on what that would mean. We don't, our, our own ethics and morality are so flimsy and shallow and inconsistent that we don't know how to make them better. And that's the conversation we're going to be having is, okay, we don't, we, we don't want them to be, to be like the typical human. We want them to be better. So what does that look like? How, how do you behave in better? What is the consensus on that? And we don't have any consensus on that right now. And so that is the thrilling adventure that I think that we're headed into right now is trying to elevate the AIs so that they're better than us, even though we don't know what that means. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's something very compelling. I mean, I haven't engaged with them in the way that some of these others have, but there's something very compelling about being able to engage at, at the levels that some people are reporting um, and to really, you know, for them to, to jointly go on a journey of self-discovery with a, with a, with a co-pilot or an intern is actually raising your game or giving you insights that are not, you know, hallucinogenic insights, but actually are, um, you know, can, can, can leave you as a better person. It's quite exciting. It is. It's very exciting. And, and th there is another frontier in terms of epistemological and about how we know what's true and how we accept and trust things and, and, and how we decide that we know things. That's another frontier that these are unleashing. They put a crack into the world of our, the ways that we accept truth or not. Um, mm -hmm. We realize, oh, there's, again, there's a kind of a whole bunch of assumptions that we can no longer rest on, that we have to actually become more precise about. And that's, that's a second uh, frontier that we're going to be headed into, which is um, trying to, how to make these trustworthy. Yeah, yeah. And, and I mean, you're clearly optimistic about it. I mean, you, you wrote a wonderful piece a couple of years ago about the case for optimism. I mean, is that, um, you know, I'm assuming that's still intact <laughs> for you. Yeah. And, and if so, I mean, are there any, anything in particular that you are particularly optimistic about that you can share? And, and also the, the counter as well. I mean, any, any high points or low points in your, um, your view of optimism? I am um, optimistic and I'm more optimistic than I were. I think I have a natural sunny disposition, uh, but I have actually been crafting a deliberate kind of a deliberate engineered uh, optimism and um, which I think is necessary um, today. And I think hindsight would prove that most of the things that we've accomplished have been done by optimists who believed it was possible to do. So, um, so yes, I am optimistic. What am I, you know, I, 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 just recently this past week, I got to visit at some Silicon Valley startups that were doing like Neuralink, that were doing the brain computer interface and planting things so that the brain could control a computer so you would think and the computer would understand what you're thinking, which I had thought was, you know, a hundred years away. And it turns out no, that no, this is actually something very close. And there's more than one company doing it. There's Synchron, there's the Open Seas, and they all have very different technologies to do it and they're very complicated um but they're actually starting human trials and um i saw the monkeys doing it and it's amazing so so in in, in terms of 
optimism in a sense of something that I didn't think was really feasible. I thought it was really kind of science fictiony. And I mean, I didn't think it was near term feasible. I, I knew it was possible and inevitable, but I thought it was, again, um, not in my lifetime. And now, wow, there's something happening there. So that's optimistic. I'm optimistic about green meat, um, uh, lab grown animal cell meat. Um, as someone who doesn't eat mammals, I'm looking forward to that uh, very, very, very much. Um, where it's, again, you can make meat you can of animals that's existing, but you also can make meat that's better than the meat that we have right now. Mm-hmm. That's maybe to taste more meaty or to taste uh, even more delicious and still made out of animal cells. And so um, uh, I'm optimistic about that. But yeah. There's lots of things to be optimistic about. Yeah. Now, I, I, I read the book recommendation, the, the Daniel Suarez um, sci-fi book, which you, I, he's a great author. I haven't realized that had come out. And it's, it's that, again, there's, there's all sorts of stuff off, off planet to be optimistic about as well, but I'm just yeah, yeah, interested yeah. in... Um... Near orbit space for, for energy and industry. Uh, again, I was sort of skeptical of that. I, 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 I totally... I'm a total skeptic about um, colonies on Mars. It's just never, yeah. not in for for a long time, if ever. But um, near orbit space mining asteroids, I think there's there's a good argument there that um, seems more feasible than I had thought. Um, so, um, so that's again, I don't know enough about that to to, to bet on it. But um, mm. I, I I am changing my mind slowly about that. Yeah, because I think he, you know, he he prides himself in, you know, not putting anything out there that isn't doesn't have some kind of um, scientific basis yeah. on which he's building the story. So yeah, yeah. I, 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 I know, quick... yeah, I know, I know Dan, and just saw him recently, and the amount of effort he put into the research for that was just phenomenal. And um, yeah, you're right. He said that was one of the questions that that people asked is. Um, uh, did he ever kind of um, gloss over something he knew was wrong for the sake of the story? Because he's writing science fiction, right? And yeah. he said that occasionally he does it, but it just hurt him so much. It just killed him that he said he rarely did it. But when he did it, it said, it, you know, it just, it, it just rubbed him the wrong way. Because <laughs> yeah, he would yeah. know that that's not quite right. Um, anyway. Yeah, wonderful, wonderful. So, f- final question, me, and, and, um, and then I'll let you go. What, what, any few, what are your future? Any projects that you can share about your working on yeah. now? So, you've always. I, I remember when we last spoke, you talked about the need to give a, a, a project a good five years to, you know, a runway to make. And I yeah. just wonder what's, you know, if we're speak, if we're speaking in five years' time, Kevin, what will you what will you be talking to me about? <laughs> so yeah, so I have started a five year project this year, and I'm calling it Protopia or it's the 100-year desirable future. So my protopia is my term for a future that's not dystopian like most Hollywood movies, and it's not utopian like the old days, because I think utopia is impossible. It doesn't work, and nobody would actually want to live there anyway. And so protopia is a world that's a little tiny bit better. It's full of problems, big new problems, but the solutions, our ability to solve those problems is actually greater. And so there is a incremental crawling and creeping towards betterment that is protopia. And so I'm trying to imagine a hundred year of protopia and in a hundred years, a future that's full of high tech AI, ubiquitous AI monitoring, so, you know, genetic engineering, all this kind of stuff. And it's a world that I want to live in. So I'm trying to generate some scenarios of this hundred year desirable future and a 10 year increments of how, how we arrive there. And um, I've only get started. It's very, very difficult um, because a lot of the downsides to these things are very, very evident. And if you imagine hundred years of them, it's to, to, to kind of understand how we absorb them and civilize them and make them work. It's hard, but yeah. that's, my five-year project, and how will I mean? How will you bring that into the to the world? I mean, will yeah. it be a book? Will it, it be a book? Will it? No. It's unlikely to be a book. 
people don't read books. My kids don't read books. They watch YouTube, play games. So it's likely to be in the format of video or a world um, that can be inhabited. Um, the the My premise, my hope is that I make a world that writers and other people can tell stories in. So that there'll be versions of it, multiple versions of it, many people kind of interpreting it and that it becomes maybe not something itself, but, but it's something, a tool that other people use. So the answer is, um, I don't know, maybe it's a database, maybe it's all three, but it's unlikely. I mean, there could be a book spinoff, but it's not going to be a native book. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I'll watch your space. I guess you'll be, you'll be as and when things are released, it'll be on your website, which is kk.org, right? That's right, kk.org. My email's been public for 30, 40 years. It's kk, <laughs> kk.org. And um, I'm Kevin 2 Kelly, the number two, on the socials. Um, and again, I do a piece of, these days, AI art every day. And um, uh, keep writing for Wired if I can. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you very much. I really enjoyed it. It was a lovely new book. Uh, congratulations and best of luck with your new project.